Well, today we're going to continue looking at chapter one uh, in Ephesians, and we've been talking about the fact that we have been uh, chosen by God, that he has uh, chosen to put us, to give us spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And heavenly places is a significant connotation because it really tells us that that's ultimately the destination that we're pursuing. One of the hardest things for us to keep clear in our minds as we go through the day-to-day -day conflicts, battles, struggles, as well as the pleasures and the joys. I mean, one of the things that I think often defers us from God's plan or His will is our anticipation of something that we want to do or experience in our life. I remember before my wife and I were married, she told me that she was praying that the Lord wouldn't return before we uh, got married. And I told her, I said, you know, that really doesn't make sense because you're basically assuming that getting married to me is going to be equivalent or even close to what it's like to be married to Christ in eternity. And that caused her to really think about it. Admittedly, we're brand new Christians and didn't know a whole lot about anything. But the thing that really stands out is that my great reward, my great desire as a Christian should always be uh, to one day be home with the Lord. If you're younger and you have the fear of death and you feel like you want to accomplish things, that is more of a battle for you. But for those of us who are getting older and getting up there in years, my wife and I have been now married for 51 years and I, I can guarantee you <laughs> she, if she had to choose between going to heaven or spending eternity with me, you know, she'd choose heaven. So she, we, we get clearer as we get older on some of these issues. But nonetheless, um, it's that idea that the real blessed life is not going to be found here uh, in some kind of geographical or, geographical or chronological sense. Our real blessing is going to be found in the spiritual rewards that come when we are in heaven. And uh, at my age, you go through so many uh, painful and heartbreaking situations that you yearn for that day when it says in Revelation, there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more death, no more sickness. Uh, as I watch some of my beloved friends going through uh, the pains of cancer and heart disease and other things, it, it just breaks you on the inside and you just say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And yet, even as we say it, we're also reminded by the Spirit, I believe, that there are still many who don't know Him, who haven't yet experienced the being chosen by God to be one of His special ones. Well, that's where we pick up next in the, in the second blessing that He has predestined us for a purpose, and that is to be adopted as His Son through Jesus Christ. Now, the word predestined here is used in a secular way that's very different than the way it's used in a biblical way. Uh, predestined in our secular culture means we're basic automatons. We had no choice. Um, we don't really have a will, and we're basically designed to move along a path until we get to the end of it, and then we expire and, and then go into eternity. Uh, there's a whole theological school. We often call it uh, uh, Calvinism or Reformed theology, but all Calvinists are not necessarily necessarily hardcore predestinists. We call them, them the five pointers. Uh, we call it hyper or hypo Calvinism. There's these different categories so that we can debate these issues amongst ourselves with uh, euphemisms and rather than having to go through lengthy explanations. But the long and short of it is that I don't hold to that idea. I believe that free will is something that's clearly expressed over and over again in the scriptures. In fact, uh, none of the Christian life makes any sense. The Bible would make no sense if everything were predestined. And so uh, you have to make basically a decision to kind of make a, a logical glitch. You basically turn off your logic and say, because I want these things to be this way, I don't have to really think them through. It also, I think for many people, gives them an out that they don't really have to worry about evangelism. They don't have to worry about people going to hell or people making bad choices. Basically, uh, your bad choices are on you and uh, I don't have to labor in prayer and, and, and pleading with God because God's already decided what's going to happen. Can you see that what really gets lost is compassion? I'll never forget something that uh, Pastor Don McClure said many years ago when he was having a conversation, a debate with uh, these guys who were strongly in this idea of the predestined fate of everybody. Some people are predestined to heaven, some are predestined to hell. And he, in the end of the conversation, he made a really, I think, telling point that really illustrated the distinction. He said, the reason I will never believe what you guys are saying, even if you can convince me out of scripture, which I don't think he can, but he says, I wouldn't leave it because you're, the one thing that you don't have is love. You don't love lost people. 
And I think that becomes critical because it does give you an excuse not to really come emotionally connected. And I think that's more of a defense mechanism. I find that people who tend to be really attracted to the predestined uh, theory is, or view of Christianity is the, uh, the fact that you don't have to really become emotionally connected. You can keep it all up here, but you don't really have to feel anything. Um, God weeps. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. If Jerusalem was predestined to be destroyed, why did he weep over the city? And uh, I know you can offer a counter argument, but that just doesn't seem to be even uh, logical to me. Well, uh, you, you know where I stand on it, so you'll understand where I go from here. But I think that the predestination he's talked is not so much predestination of our fate, but a predestination of his purpose. In other words, if I've been chosen by God, then God predestines, he creates a plan that will begin with him adopting me into sonship through Jesus Christ. And this is in accordance with his pleasure and will. In other words, that I am predestined once I have been chosen to be the object of God's pleasure and the focus of his will. And he says, this ends to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given it to us in the one that is in Jesus he loves. So out of the Father's love for the Son, he has purposed and planned out your life to fulfill his great pleasure and his great will. And all of it's being motivated not by who you are or what you are. It's not your intellect, your skill, your abilities, your experience, or any of those kinds we try to credit ourselves with. It's all about the fact that God is revealing how gracious he is and that grace is rooted in one thing, the love that he has for his son, Jesus Christ. So we're the beneficiaries and we have been adopted in the family. And it's as if Jesus found us, you know, walking around the streets, homeless and childless, our parentless, and he brought us home to his father and said, can we adopt this poor waif as part of our family? And the father seeing how much the son loved us said, yes, he may become part of your family. And at that moment, as we became in him, in part of his, his family, he, we began to conform our lives to the will and the purpose of that family. Our identity now was no longer with our biological family. Our identity is now with our heavenly father. So that's why when Jesus said, uh, no longer call any man on, on earth your father, because you only have one father and he's in heaven. That's because our earthly fathers are no longer the source of our identity. Our identity is in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And the father says, therefore, you're part of my family. So this kind of transformational experience that we have is powerful because as Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 12, he said, don't conform to the world. In other words, all the flesh can do is conform to what's around it. But he says being transformed by the Holy Spirit. And the word that's used there in original, it may mean, literally means to be changed from one condition to another, from one state into another. It's the idea of the metamorphosis where the word that original comes from, uh, or, or it basically birthed, uh, the idea of a, a, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. Uh, now, and we know biologically that they're the same entity, but in appearance, it's suddenly there's this transformational change. It's not the same. One goes from something that's kind of grubby in the most grub-like sense, and suddenly it becomes this beautiful thing that flies with colors resilient, uh, more beautiful than anything else we'll see in nature. And so to understand this, this idea that what God predestined was not the the, the fact that we would want to be chosen, but he predestined that we would be transformed. And that's the joy of the Christian life, that what you see today is not whom I will be in eternity. And there's not a one of us who doesn't really take an honest look at ourselves and say, God, I, I would like to be free from some of these things in my life. Well, when we're with him, we will be free and we'll see him going through that process of changing us even now, preparing us, why? The more he lets me see how sinful I am at my core, the more I yearn to be with him in heaven and have a new body, where the core of my new body is going to be holiness, purity, sanctity, godliness. I mean, that's gonna be the core. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, as the right Paul, or excuse me, John said in his first letter, we will see, be like him for we will see him as he is. That's the hope. That's what God is predestined for those who believe. People who are unsaved, they're not predestined to be unsaved. 
They're given the opportunity to believe, but we become predestined the moment we believe. Boy, I hope that's clear. <laughs> I know these are hard concepts to kind of get your mind around, but it's so important at the same time that we see ourselves correctly with a, with a clear lens while we go on every day in Christ. God bless you, and we'll pick it up tomorrow.